have reached rest grace with rwgresearch.com. Open dash source dash energy. What's up everybody? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com and quantumgravityresearch.org. So today I'm going to show you what I've been doing for a while. Uh, I announced that I'll be doing cold fusion. Um, I published a video on a box that I was building. This is actually the box right here. Now the interesting thing is, is that what I would like to show you guys today is the entire system. So everything that I've constructed, uh, constructed everything that I've done, and I want you guys to view it, look at it, think about it, and then give me your feedback. What can I make better? What did I do wrong that I should have done differently? Is there something that would be more beneficial to do a different way? So the idea of this video is to get your feedback and to show you what I've done. So let's get started. All right, so what I'm going to show you guys here is basically the calorimeter that I've put together. Now I've constructed this to be designed to be used for uh, deuterium gas and hydrogen gas and the sample that I'll be putting in here. So it's very sensitive and it is an air unit. So the, the gases inside of my box here are all air. All right, so here we go. First things first, I am running hydrogen here. I have a vacuum pump down here and I have deuterium here. And those are my gases for this control system. Uh, briefly, I should note that the power supplies that you see here are step-up transformers. I have a 3000 watt battery backup system underneath this table and I'm running these down converting and running everything off of a steady system so that I don't have any fluctuations in voltage and such and uh, if loss of power we should still continue testing. So let's get into it. Let's show you exactly what's inside here. Let me open it up. Okay, so here's what's inside of here. I have two circulating fans right here just to keep the air moving. So here's the idea behind, uh, behind this setup. I guess I should explain it a little bit better. Uh, basically, I have a box inside of here which has two internal cavities. It actually has three, but two that I'm uh, using for a purpose. And I've taken the inside of these two cavities and I'm trying to do my experiment in there. So this box is designed to try to keep everything stable with inside of there. Then the airspace you see, there's airspace here on the back side and in the front. And what I'm trying to do is circulate air inside of here and I am heating it. I'm heating it with a heat plate right here. I'm trying to make a steady constant temperature. So this space is considered my room if you want to be room controlled space. Uh, or air controlled room if you want to call it that. So that's what I'm doing with, with this portion of it. Now the inside here which will open up and I'll explain a little more there again is designed to be a steady temperature inside of here. So this is my styrofoam box and uh, I just took aluminum tape which is very thick is about 3.5 uh, mils and I covered the entire box from top to bottom left to right inside and outside and it actually helped quite a bit. So that's why everything's aluminized. So let's pop more of this apart and I'll show you what's inside the next one. All right, so the box is open. This is what it looks like inside of here. So briefly, let me give you a description of where all of my probes are at so that you know. The silver is really difficult to see on the back of here, so you just have to bear with me. On the back side of this, there's also a second chamber. That's my control chamber. So what I decided to do is actually put two chambers in here. One was a control chamber and one is my test chamber. So I'm using the control chamber as if, if there's something happening in both of them, then it's not a reaction that's happening with my material that I'm wanting to test. So one's a control and one's a test. And what this is comprised of is basically several fittings and there is a four wire RTD right here. Now I've chosen four wire RTDs because they are the most uh, accurate that you can get. Here is the Omega part number of the ones that I am using. I really like these. Uh, the four wire allows to cancel all resistance in the wire and only use the thermistor type RTD at the end of the um, probe. So one of the probes is inside here, one is inside this chamber which the lid gets tight against here. The back side is the same, one there, one there. And then I also have RTDs on the top, which you can see one hanging down. 
So there's an RTD there, and there's also one mounted to this heat plate down at the bottom. Okay, so there's one mounted on this heat plate. And that one's not really necessary, but it's been a good uh, troubleshooting type of thing. So here we have a pressure transducer. This is VAC all the way up to 280 PSI. Um, I don't necessarily recommend this particular transducer. It has done a good job so far, but it has some tolerance errors. And uh, I'm not too terribly concerned about pressure. It's nice to know. So it's sort of a reference value. So that's basically where my probes were. I also have a probe RTD. One is mounted up here, you can barely see, and one is mounted inside, okay, and that just gives me a temperature of the room and also gives me a temperature of the entire idea of what's going on in the outside environment. Okay, so the first question you might have is why is it in a lab hood? Well, two reasons. One, there's a, there's a fire suppression system on this lab hood. Um, that way if something went crazy, then it would automatically fire and hopefully extinguish the flames. Now during these tests, I'm actually not running the fume hood. It's just in there for two purposes. One, fire hazard, in case anything would happen, and two, Basically, this is one more containment, one more box to put this inside of. And, and actually, I've noticed that the, when the room temperature swings a lot, the temperature inside of my actual box uh, does not swing. Uh, it does swing when it gets dramatic, but I'm saying in the quick notions of a, of a, a, a gust coming through here, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change anything. So that seems to work really well. So actually, what I'm going to show you how I disassemble this, and, uh, and we'll look at the, the insides closer. Okay, so as you can see right here, everything is attached with quick connectors. All of these have numbers and they're listed and they each have a purpose. Each go to a unit. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to pull all of these apart. Like this. And now we will take things out of the box as needed. All right. One piece at a time. Here we go. Fan comes first. It's still on. Don't get your finger in there. Like I said, everything is on quick connects. This makes it easy to dismantle everything. All right, I've got these. Uh, when I run the real, real test, I'm going to be putting some tape on these little slits. I have these in here to uh, hold the wires, but it's not a perfect seal, so I will seal that better once we get to that stage. So let's go ahead and we're gonna need to slide this over, undo this one fitting. This is where my gas comes in and also comes out. These are a type of swedge lock fittings. These are not actual swedge locks, but they're very similar in their function. Okay, so we disconnect there. Make sure we've got all of our leads. Now I have a tape on the side of these boxes. I'm grounding all the aluminum. So that's what this little white wire is, and that's what this little green wire is. So we'll go ahead and slide this out. And we will put it over here, and I'll show you what the heat plate looks like. Let's get a close-up of the heat plate so you can see exactly what I've got going on here. This is basically a piece of scrap uh, stainless steel. And on the bottom side, There are some 25 watt heat resistors. Now I'm running them, uh, they're 24 volt a piece, 25 watt a piece. There are uh, four of them. However, I've got them running in parallel, two and two, and then in series. So it's parallel series, a total of four. And they're just, it's just sitting in here. These sit in these slots and it's down far enough that 
the top clears, but it's far enough down that the air can get under it. So air passes under and over in a circulation, which is why those fans are in here. In case you're wondering, yes, I will be insulating all of the piping coming out. This is insulated from the inside, but I will be insulating everything out here as well. Okay, so here's the main, main components. Let's go ahead and, uh, and also pull this apart so you can see what's going on. Have to make sure I pull this probe out. Make sure our wires are not tangled. I'll go ahead and pull this calibration probe wire off. And this whole entire thing basically slides out of here. I'm going to set it down and move the box and show you exactly what we got going on here. Okay, so this is what we got going on. Our tubes inside of here, it's basically a loop. It's a, it's a, it's a full loop, so the gases are able to get from all the way around the loop from the control side and the other side. So here you can see this is the control side and this is the uh, the test side. So everything fits really tight in here. I got a little bit of acetone on this styrofoam one day cleaning things so I got to go back and repair some of this a little bit. Tends to happen. So um, this is basically it and some of you may ask me why did you design it like this? Well I'll show you what goes inside of here and then you'll understand. But basically, I have to be able to take this entire apparatus and then stick it in the glove box, okay? So this allows me to take the entire chamber out and fit it nicely inside of the glove box, where then I can work in an argon environment. So that's the purpose of being able to take this whole thing apart. It's very challenging to figure out the best way to do that, and this is what I've come up, come up with. So let me show you what's inside of that chamber. Okay, so without dismantling this, because I'd rather not take this entire thing apart at the moment because I'm about to run a calibration test, what I'm going to show you is what's inside. So inside of there I'm going to be putting my material, which is going to be powder form. Okay, so my powdered material is going to go inside one of these capsules. This is a stainless steel filtered stainless steel filter, centered filter, okay? Now it doesn't look like it's got holes in there, however this is 0.5 microns. This is a 0.5 micron filter. I can actually push air through here just by blowing through it. So inside here on my calibration, okay, my actual calibration piece, this is an old version but it basically looks something like this. So I have the capsule on top and the fitting and inside this capsule I have a resistor. So I'm, doing, I'm, do, I'm using a resistor, I'm powering it with exactly how much power I know is going in there, all right, and it is heating up the system. And that is what I'm measuring for calibration, so it's resistive calibration. So far this method seems to, to work really well. The only trouble that I'm having, and this is a good question for you guys to answer, is the crosstalk. Now because this is a loop, Okay, everything is looped all the way around and comes back to both chambers, pressure transducer and the in and exit port. I am, I'm going to have some crosstalk here and that's fine. So what I plan on doing is wrapping everything with insulative tape, okay, fiberglass tape. Uh, this is just tape and this is like actually sticky backed fiberglass tape. So I'm going to wrap this whole thing and, and then hopefully that'll, uh, that'll help with the with some of the crosstalk. Now the other part of what's crosstalk, when I say crosstalk I mean if I try to heat this chamber it's actually also heating the control chamber. That is kind of a problem. I am able to hold a very steady temperature inside of the entire unit, entire, in, in, inside the whole entire box and so I have an error, uh, 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 you know I have basically a little bit of error there with, with, uh, with the whole system and so the crosstalk from this one heating the other side, the control um, that's a problem and I'm not really sure of the solution. I'm not sure if I just use the 
uh, temperature in t inside of the whole box because I know what it is and just you know create my differential. Right now I'm just saying if the control is at 40 C and the uh, test chamber is at 41 C then I have one degree Celsius in my delta. But if I heat things up too hot then the control changes and my values are actually skewed a little bit. So you guys can, uh, you can maybe help me out on exactly what you think I need to do there. All right, in case you're wondering, um, I actually have a control resistor, basically this guy, built inside of this bottom chamber. And then the same thing with, with this one. I actually did the exact same thing so that they would both be exactly the same. So what I'll actually be doing is filling these up, making small capsules, okay, where they close shut. So these capsules will actually be pushed shut, crimped together, not opened back up for the test anyway. And then that will actually be put inside of these chambers. And that's, that's how I'm loading the uh, very fine particulate powders that, I've been, that, I'm, that I'm using. I needed a way to contain them. And they will not go through this filter, but the deuterium and hydrogen will. And uh, also, I plan on, and I'm having a hard time finding, but I plan on using a piece of CR39 plastic inside of here to detect alpha particles. So I, am, I have thought about that. Uh, through all this aluminum, you're not going to be able to take anything outside, especially this stainless steel chamber. So yes, I have thought about that, and uh, that was actually, um, I actually asked Ed Storms, what, what should I use for alpha particle detection, and he recommended CR39. So that's, that's something that I'll be using. So the software, as you see here, I'm actually running LabVIEW. I did build this entire program from the ground up, and um, it took me uh, several weeks accounting to actually learn LabVIEW because this is something that I did on my uh, on my own terms here and I learned LabVIEW taught myself so for uh, for the short amount of time I believe I did a, a fairly good job I actually um, had one problem with one thing and I asked uh, the guys over at quantumheat.org to uh, send me their program and they they did what they're using on one of their systems and I was able to figure out what I was trying to do with that so that was very kind of them to do so I thought I'd note that so here's the back side of the program. It does not fit on one screen. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with LabVIEW, I, I think you should check it out. It is very expensive software. But what you got to remember is uh, you get really good value for your money. Now, most of us grad, garage lab scientists are not going to be able to afford this. So what you can do is you can sign up on the National Instruments website for free, download it, and if you give them the, your information, they'll actually let you uh, use the trial version for I believe it was up to three months so inside of here it's just a bunch of uh, case statements and things going on there is boxes inside boxes inside boxes all sorts of fun stuff going on here so uh, you can check out LabVIEW but what, what we're interested in is in the front interface here so what I've got here is just a a graph it's quite big I have everything on here and then here you can see all the IO points different uh, different things that I'll be taking in and recording and uh, I also have down here a data logging system where I can actually record all this data being graphed and my PID control which I'll explain in a little bit and then my calibration uh, setup which I'll also be telling you about later there's another tab here that's got all my calibration points a few setup points and a, uh, a few more setup points so that's the software side. I'm not going to get too technical into that right now. If you'd like to know more about that, I can make a detailed video of just the software if you'd like. So we'll move on to the hardware. So here's the hardware. Basically what I've got here is, we'll start out with the PID. Okay, the PID power supply. This is the relay controlling the heating inside the, uh, inside the control system. There's a uh, RS-485, uh, uh, yeah, and it is linked to the PID, which I'm receiving and sending data to. Um, here I have a measurement computing USB temp, and it has an 8-channel. This actually is a really nice unit because it will accept multiple different types of inputs. So the type of inputs are um, electronic, which is like a, a standard transistor-looking package. It's digital. Um, and then also thermocouple, RTD, and thermistor. So it does them all. It's a really nice unit. Um, I should also note the make and model of the controller. It's an easy zone, and I cannot pronounce their name. Uh, I like it for the most part. 
If you'd like to know the actual part number, it's right there. Uh, the power supply is just a 24 volt power supply. And um, then back here we also have a measurement computing USB 2416 4AO. Now this has four analog outputs and it also basically does 16 channels of, um, of IO input. Now this is just voltage and um, thermocouple. It's designed for thermocouples but I'm using it for voltage purposes. Um, personally I do not like this unit um, I really do like this unit. This is an older version, this is a newer version. So uh, I recommend if you buy anything for uh, RTDs, or thermocouples, this seems to work really well so far. Um, this one's so-so. So next on our hardware list is we have two power supplies here. I'm only using one currently. These are uh, HP, these are older power supplies. Um, I, I've received these from eBay used and they're a thousand watts a piece, zero to 60 volts, zero to 50 amps, a constant current or constant voltage output, and they are really, really good units. Let me give you a poke of what's on the back side here because there is a lot of, of I.O. down here going on. Lots of different inputs and outputs, signal processes, you can even do uh, fold back and you can do uh, sensing feedback and you can tie multiple supplies together. These are actually very expensive power supplies. Uh, there is uh, a bunch on eBay, ended up purchasing these and they seem to be working fairly well for me. I um, am sending these very sensitive into the uh, six digit after the decimal place uh, voltage and it just, it's really nice. I, I like these supplies. So that's basically the hardware. All right, so what I'd briefly like to share with you guys is uh, how I calibrated the system. So currently, I'm not actually able to read the direct current off of this power supply. It's such a small, small, small current. The value inside of the uh, test calibration is actually a 10K ohm resistor. And I did that so that I could use 60 volts to get a very fine, uh, fine-tuned measurement. So instead of dealing with tiny little voltages, I wanted to be able to use this power supply uh, and, and be able to control those fine voltages. And it does a very good job of that. It's very stable. So what I did is I took the oscilloscope, and I'll show you some video of that in the background while I'm talking, but I took the oscilloscope and I connected it up to the resistor at the resistor points as close as I could get them, and then calibrated everything, entered that into a curve, on my uh, lab view, okay, so that was a scaling algorithm, and basically that's what I'm using currently as my as my power measurement. Now I am reading the actual voltage of this power supply, and I'm data logging it just to make sure there's not something fishy going on. But every time I've turned on this system, it's basically done its job and it's been spot on pretty well every time. There's only been one time where it was flaky, and that was because I had something set up wrong in the power supply. So I trust that the uh, power supply is giving me exactly what it says from the first time that I calibrated it and uh, it, it appears to be working good. So that's actually the, the method that I used to calibrate my milliwatts system. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is actually show you guys the calibration curve that I've created. Um, I run through a series of power input and then check my calibration. Currently I've actually only got it set up to go up about 366 milliwatts and the reason for that is is because my 0 to 60 volts that's what it gives me I can use two of these supplies to get my voltage higher but for the moment I'll run the tests and see what kind of uh, power output I get I'm using very very small samples okay the sample has to fit inside these capsules so in order for them to fit inside these capsules you have to have a very precise measuring system so I believe that this is precise enough uh, through the calibration curves, it appears between 1 and 2 milliwatts, okay, 1 and 2 milliwatts is my error tolerance. Above 2 milliwatts, you know, you get into 10 milliwatts and 5 milliwatts, you can totally detect them, no big problem. But when the room temperature swings, you know, there's an error tolerance of like 0.02 to 0.04 degrees Celsius. 0.02 to 0.04 degrees Celsius. That's my error tolerance. Um, so 
you know, that's really, really, really good. I'm really pleased with that because of the, the room temperature. This room is not controlled very nicely. So I have to do that a little bit with these heaters and try to keep it at a steady temperature. And even when the room swings really high and low, that's still close to my air tolerance. Um, so I just need to take note when I do everything that if my room swings more than those temperatures, my air tolerance actually moves up a little bit. And I have all those calibration curves and been doing lots of testing for weeks now to kind of understand the system, know how it works, and see what's best for it and, uh, and what I need to do. So there you go. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the calibration data. Now this has uh, all been recorded well after that video that you just watched was produced. Um, and so just bear with me here. Uh, first of all, the, the time down here is completely wrong. The time is right, but the graph uh, date uh, is actually wrong. That's due to some things I'm still working on with this program. Um, so currently, uh, I in my video, I showed you that I was only doing a calibration measurement. I figured out a way to connect the power supply to the data logger and actually read the voltage. Uh, but because the current is so low, it's not accurate on the HP power supply. So I did actually include here a simulated milliwatts, which uh, is not shown on this graph, but I did actually get that to work. Uh, unfortunately, since the milliwatt rating is so small, the power supply doesn't really detect that correctly. So I can't really use the data, but I, I simulated it, so at least I could get a true voltage reading and make sure that the voltage I'm seeing on the display on the front is truly what's going in. It's just an, it's just an error check value. Anyway, so looking at this graph, this is my calibration data. So as you can see, this line right here is actually the power input in milliwatts, okay, from zero all the way up to 350 milliwatts. Um, I guess real quickly, this is the delta on your chambers. This is the percentage of output. This is the pressure, the temperature and degrees for everything except for the room and the um, inside the lab hood, which is these two values here. The legend, legend is up here in the corner. I know it's hard to see, uh, but I'm going to walk you through this, so again, bear with me. So I applied here over a period of time, okay, every, uh, I believe this was every five hours, or was it every ten hours? It might have been every ten hours. Yeah, I think it's ten hours. So every ten hours, I basically applied a different voltage here, all right? 12, 12, yeah, 10 hours, okay. So every time I changed uh, a step, it was basically 10 hours. Um, so this is an overview of the entire thing. This back here is the percentage of output power. You can see it fluctuating with room temperature. Uh, you can see these funny looking jaggedy points on my graph and these flat spots. That's actually the evening. This is the, the heaters turning on and off and on and off. This is during the day. Uh, unfortunately, the sun hits the, uh, the big door there you saw in the background creates sort of a mess uh, as far as with holding a stable temperature. Um, so here you can see the delta but before the tests ever start, which was from here over. Pretty flat, even with a little room fluctuation. That's really flat, um, which I'll give you some close-ups later. Uh, the red here is the uh, control chamber. The blue is the chamber I'm applying heat to. Uh, and then you have the squiggly line down here, the turquoise, that's actually the temperature inside the box. Um, and I actually have another probe that's attached to the heat plate, but it's not on this graph currently because it's quite high and it messes up the visuals of my graph. Um, then you also have this green line and this other pinkish looking line, purplish pinkish. Those two are basically, this green is inside of the um, control chamber section of the box and then this is inside the uh, test chamber uh, basically reading any ambient excess heat outside of the chamber that I'm seeing in my control box. So let's look at a close-up. Um, here is the same graph with a lot less noise in the background. You see I disabled a lot of the, uh, the, the visuals here so we can see what's going on. So you can clearly see the input power here and then here um, is the control chamber and the test chamber and then the delta between the two is that line that you see here. Now you can see there's a little mess right here. Uh, I can zoom in. This is actually due to the fact that I lost uh, about three hours of data but it didn't really affect my test. Uh, I, I was flatlining on my on my curve here um, so no worries. And I tried to make the test long enough so that 
you see a flat plane here so that it had the, the system had time to level out so we know exactly applying this many milliwatts is actually this many uh, differential in temperature uh, now a thing to note here is you can see this control chamber is actually raising okay and that throws off my delta completely this is that crosstalk I was talking about um, I eliminated a lot of it by wrapping the system with the insulation but unfortunately there's still a little there and really I just have to compensate for that in my math uh, when I actually do true power reading measurements, I just I just have to know what I've got here and sort of compensate for it. So there is some issues there, but you know, at the moment, that's what we got. So let's look at a close up here. Okay, so this is a close up of between zero milliwatts and ten milliwatts, as you can see right here. So I stepped it from one to five to ten. Um, so here you can see the, the little bit of noise that's my error tolerance I was talking about All right, and then we stepped up to one and it's sort of bumped up but I don't have this on the display but if you were to look at the room temperature actually the room temperature swung right here and that's why so that's that's actually an error of 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 measurement according to my room temperature um, that's why it did that then as soon as you jump up to about five milliwatt you can clearly see this nice peak so it goes from about um, what one or point one seven up to about point zero seven it's currently a negative number it doesn't actually start at zero zeros here that just happens because these are not exactly flat lined uh, the probes are this much different these are true temperatures and the probes have a tiny bit of variation between them so you have to sort of offset them I didn't offset them I'm just taking true measurements over here uh, it's not worth taking the time to set everything to a zero delta whenever you can just measure the difference in potential. So point uh, one seven here, and bumped up. Mm, you know, it peaked off. You can see this dip. That's again due to room temperature. So this is again in my error tolerance range. But we'll say point zero seven. So what's that? Point one degree. Uh, point one degrees Celsius in temperature differential between the. Um, one milliwatt step and the five milliwatt step so this is actually a four milliwatt differential change here is what you're seeing because we went from one to five so that's only four so this is actually a four um, and then here you can see we stepped up again uh, a five count this time and we had this temperature change differential here which was again uh, we can say we started at point zero eight and went up to about point one that's about point seven uh, so it's not uh, it's not exactly the same uh, according to what you have here. You have to do plus or minus your error tolerance too. It's kind of tricky. Uh, so here is a overview where you can get to see this true error tolerance. So uh, this was what basically almost a day, not quite, not quite two days here, about a day and a half, and you can see you know our little bit of air tolerance that I was that I was referring to I was putting no heat in here but yet I was seeing a, a difference in potential between these two chambers um, so that's 0.19 not even quite but 0.195 to about uh, 0.17 all right so that's my roughly 0 0.2 0 0.02 degrees Celsius air tolerance excuse me so pretty small and then the last graph here just shows sort of uh, an overview of uh, the system again. So there you go. That is my uh, calibration data. And um, I hope that made sense to you. So let's continue the video. All right. There's one more thing I wanted to point out here. And that is some of you are going to say, well, what's your power input? What are you heating here? What's going on? Well, here's the thing. In, uh, in certain experiments, you don't have to put any heat into the system. The system will do its job all by itself using the deuterium. Okay, so it's either D to D fusion or D to uh, PD fusion or or something of those natures, okay? Um, so here's the thing. Some of you are going to ask me, well, you're you're heating the inside of this box, right? You're using, you're, you're putting power in. How are you calculating how much power you're putting in? Well, here's the deal. What I am set up for is very precise measuring. So very low amounts of power and very precise. That was my goal for this system. I wanted to be able to measure down to the one milliwatts range. 
um, and one to two milliwatts is error tolerance. So five milliwatts, 10 milliwatts, excellent. That, that's, that's really good. And so the thing is, is if I get a lot of excess heat in some of these experiments, I can completely remove the input power altogether with the heating of this heat plate and the PID here. Completely remove them and remove them from the system completely so there's no questions of where the excess heat's coming from. Um, so just a, just a side note that I definitely need, needed to stick in here. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this overview and hopefully it was helpful. And uh, hopefully I explained myself well enough for you guys to get to understand completely what I've done here. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I will post a link on my forums. Please go there and actually leave comments, questions, so we can discuss it over there. Uh, YouTube comments are a bit challenging to get through sometimes. It doesn't always work. They're better than they used to be. But I'd recommend you going over to open-source-energy.org and using the forums there. It's free to sign up if you don't have an account. And give me some feedback. So what I would like to know is what, what can I change to make this system better? Um, is there anything you, know, you think I could do differently? And uh, just the general notion of what do you guys think? I'm curious. Okay? All right. Peace and love. God bless you guys. Have a good day and uh, have a good week, good month. I'll see you later.